We Happy Few was a long time in the making, developed by Compulsion Games and published by Gearbox in 2018 after two years of early access. For a game from a small indie studio and supported by a Kickstarter, We Happy Few built up quite a bit of hype and it is easy to see why. The character design with the smiling masks is attention grabbing and the 1984 slash Bioshock-esque feel resonated with a lot of people. The lead up to the release even saw the publisher release a music video for the in-game band The Make Believes and a mock pharmaceutical sales ad for the in-game drug Joy, both of which really capture the facade of normalcy and happiness hiding a horrifying truth. But across the board, most people who played We Happy Few never completed it, and a lot of people felt incredibly let down by the game upon its final release. As at the time of making this video, a check of my Xbox achievements shows that only 1.56% of players finished the main game. PlayStation players apparently have the highest completion rate of 6.7%, while Steam reports a completion rate of 5.9%. To put the completion rates in perspective, According to Steam, 27% of Dark Souls Remastered players obtained the Link the Fire ending, and 17% obtained the Dark Lord ending. So conservatively, we can say about one third of Dark Souls players beat that game. So why then did this much, much easier and much shorter We Happy Few do so badly? In this video, I will be examining this question and why We Happy Few is the best game you'll probably never finish. I'm only looking at the main game in this video because that is where the issues are. The DLCs are actually all fantastic and offer unique experiences worlds better than the main game. I will be breaking up this video into three sections, the good, the bad, and the good in theory, bad in practice for those elements that could have been brilliant if exercised correctly. This isn't going to be a full review. There are a number of elements that I won't really be talking about that are just fine not reasons to play the game or reasons to abandon it. The crafting system and the level up system, for example, are fine, better than a lot of games, but no one is choosing to play or not play this game because of them. I'm also not going to be talking about the game's bugs and glitches here. We Have A Few is notorious for its bugs, and while today the bugs are largely harmless, there were a number of game-breaking bugs on release that meant some quests could not be completed. I imagine there were a lot of players who picked up the game, ran into these bugs or experienced repeated crashes, put the game down and never came back. If you were someone who stopped playing the game a couple of years ago due to bugs, now is probably a good time to give it another go. And let me give you some reasons why by first turning to the good parts of the game, the story and its characters. The story of We Happy Few is fantastic, far more intriguing than what is offered by most AAA titles. Wellington Wells is a town of people forced to surrender their children in the midst of World War II. The people cope with this by taking joy, a drug which forces them to be happy, but also blinds them to their own looming demise through starvation, plague, and a breakdown of essential infrastructure. I have made previous videos on the story of We Happy Few in each of the DLCs, which I will link in the description box below. I won't be going into the full story in this video, but do be aware that there are spoilers ahead, including spoilers for the endings. The game has three main characters who each have their own chapter or act. Act 1 is Arthur Hastings, who wants to leave Wellington Wells to find his brother Percy, one of the taken children. Act 2 is Sally Boyle. She is a chemist who has a baby she's trying to keep secret, and ultimately she too wants to escape Wellington Wells with her child. Act 3 is Ollie Starkey, who is trying to remember what happened during the war, and when he learns the truth, he wants to share this with the rest of the population. Each of these stories are well done and incredibly complex. The first time playing the game and learning that the tanks Germans used to threaten the town were fake was brilliant and chilling. The twist endings for Arthur and Ollie were also memorable and heartbreaking, while Sally's story of a girl whose mother murdered her family and then trying to be a better mother to her own child in a town where children can't exist was emotionally compelling. Each of the characters feel completely connected to their world. Wellington Wells is a small town. Arthur, Sally and Ollie all know each other and they all know different people around the town and throughout their stories they run into these friends and enemies and regularly comment on the different townspeople. The NPCs also often have their own stories running through the events of the game. Prudence Holmes, for example, was a co-worker of Arthur's, having the office down the hall from his. She was allegedly on holiday, but if Arthur investigates her office, 
you find she had also gone off her joy. There are a number of notes throughout the game that talk about Prudence's life and actions in trying to make her own escape from Wellington Wells. Arthur eventually finds her body in the tunnels that lead to the bridge out of Wellington Wells. How she died is not shown, but it appears a rock has pinned her legs in place, and with the toxic fumes and no gas mask, she likely suffocated, having almost succeeded in making her escape. Prudence demonstrates that the people of Wellington Wells want things and live lives and make choices not dissimilar to the player characters. It makes them feel quite real, and it makes you feel for them. The environmental storytelling also reinforces the impact the loss of the children had on the people of Wellington Wells, and the effects of the joy they take to forget this. The garden district is full of graffiti about the children, and one of the saddest sights in the game is a pit full of children's toys that will never be used again. Even in town where things are meant to be good, there are signs that things are not actually okay. The houses have notes the residents leave to themselves to remember day-to-day -day things the joy makes them forget. There are downer breaches where people have gone off their joy. There are also numerous inaccessible buildings proclaiming the occupant is on holidays. Because the prospect of death might make people sad, anytime someone dies in Wellington Wells, their absence is explained away by them, like Prudence, going on a trip or a holiday. This extends to the player characters, so if your character dies in game, you will be shown the newspaper article about their holiday, which is a brilliant and thoughtful touch. We also see tidbits of lore scattered across the landscape, providing clues to the differences between the real world and this alternate reality, which are also compelling and adds to the sense that events similar to that of the game could have happened in reality if things had just gone a bit differently. One of the things about We Happy Few that makes the story unique is the unreliability of its narrators. Arthur, Sally and Ollie each have their own memories and versions of events, and each of them are flawed. Arthur's story has repeated flashbacks to his childhood and how he was too old to go to Germany with his brother Percy. But in the final flashback, he remembers that actually Percy was the older brother, and Arthur had tricked him into going to Germany with him, only for Arthur to jump off the train at the last moment and steal Percy's identity, sending Percy to Germany in Arthur's place. Ollie is accompanied throughout his storyline by his beloved daughter Margaret, only to remember at the end that Margaret was actually the daughter of his neighbour, who Ollie got killed by turning her into the Germans when her father tried to hide her from them. Sally appears to have the best grasp on her own history, as we don't see anything in the game that directly contradicts her memories. Sally is perhaps the least affected by the drugs in the game. She creates her own version of joy, and can also manufacture a fake version of joy called Sunshine, which makes it appear the user is on the real drug. Arthur has been using Joy for years, and Ollie has used an even stronger version called Oblivion to completely destroy his memories of the war and what happened with Margaret. Sally too, though, is shown to be unreliable through her interactions with Arthur. Arthur and Sally each have their own versions of the interactions between them in the game, but we can't assume that Sally's is always correct. If it was, then Arthur would have had no way of knowing what the inside of her home looked like, as he would have never gone there. Arthur and Ollie's interactions are also shown differently from the point of view of each of them. Even the locations in the game change for the different characters, most notably the home of Dr. Faraday, who Arthur remembers as being isolated in the Garden District, while both Sally and Ollie remember it as being in town. The overall impact is fascinating, and it is quite jarring the first time you seek out Arthur as Sally by heading out into the Garden District. When you remember that as Arthur, you were the one to visit Sally in her home. It shows the characters to be real and flawed people and invites the player to question everything that they are seeing and hearing in the game because they are doing so through the flawed lens of the characters. It is not often that a player is told that what they are experiencing may not be accurate and this really adds another layer to the experience. The problem though is that a game is not just the story and the enjoyment of the story is linked to the gameplay required to progress and experience it. And it is in this respect that We Happy Few lets itself and its players down. While I am about to be very critical of the gameplay, I do want to say that there are parts that are actually kind of great. Sally's foray into the booby-trapped and maze-like mystery house to deliver an antidote to a cult about to drink the Kool-Aid was a standout for me. Playing this section for the first time, I remember thinking that this quest, being about halfway through the game's second act, was the best one so far. I wish that there were more sections like this, but if there were, I probably wouldn't be making this video. Most quests in We Happy Few, unfortunately, are fetch quests. Sticking to Sally's playthrough for an example of this, 
Her storyline basically starts with a multi-stage fetch quest. You have to go to the shop to get some tinned milk for her daughter, but the shopkeeper will only give you the milk if you go to a local cult to steal some records for him. But before doing that, Sally wants to go home to pick up some supplies to blend in with the locals. So you do that, then head off to steal the records. After you steal the records, it's back to the shop to collect the milk, and then back to Sally's house to feed Gwen. Not only is this a fetch quest, but it's an incredibly dull one, which doesn't set you up to be excited about this second act of the game, especially coming off Arthur's hectic escape through the Motiline tunnels. And there are far too many quests that play out the same way, with the player being sent to collect something only for the person they're collecting it from either not having it, not being there, or wanting the player to go and do something else for them first. It really feels at times that the game is intentionally drawing things out for the sake of making the game longer. And this leads into my main issue with We Happy Few. As the game progresses, it truly feels like the studio was worried about the game going too quickly, so they did everything they could to slow it down. A persistent mechanic throughout the game is stamina, with each of the three protagonists only being able to run or fight for a short period before they need to catch their breath. Realistic, sure, but when combined with the endless back and forth fetch quest lines and clunky combat, it becomes more frustrating than immersive. Of course, you don't even need to worry about stamina in the early stages of the game when you're walking around the town, because if you run at all, then the bobbies and the townsfolk will take great offence and decide the only logical response is to bludgeon you to death. The bobbies feel the same way about seeing you outside at night time, running or not, so the early stages of the game involve many slow, leisurely daytime strolls. There are perks you can obtain to cancel these effects out, but it takes way too long to get them, so by the time you do, most of the character story is finished. In Sally's story, the game introduces a special new mechanic that is Totems of Parental Neglect. These totems appear in Sally's inventory. They have a weight of two and they continuously stack until Sally takes care of her daughter. The issue that I immediately ran into though, is that in order to take care of Gwen, you need to complete the quest to get the tinned milk. And part of this quest has a locked door, which requires a lockpick, and lockpicks need to be fashioned from bobby pins. I spent many in-game hours searching for bobby pins in bins and abandoned houses, while Sally collected more and more totems of parental neglect and I dropped more and more items as she kept becoming overburdened. There was nothing fun or enjoyable, realistic or immersive about this experience, and if the developers wanted to include something like this, believing it should not have been dependent on completing any particular quest in the game, particularly not one of the very first ones. Just needing to go back and check on Gwen every so often would have been annoying, but ultimately realistic for Sally's story. Whereas having the game become increasingly unplayable because you can't find one randomly spawning item is ridiculous. A similar thing then plays out in Act 3 with Ollie Starkey. Ollie is diabetic and so he needs to eat regularly and or inject his homemade glucose syringe. One of Ollie's first quests is to make some glucose syringes from honey. In order to obtain the honey, you are meant to craft a padded suit in order to avoid being stung by bees. However, if you are like me, you will just run in larger and larger circles trying to lead the bees away from the hive to steal the honey because by Act 3, another scavenger hunt for craft items is not happening. Ollie has another drawback in that he has made mortal enemies of the Jacobean Society, the fan club for local TV and radio personality Uncle Jack. Members of the society will attack Ollie on site, which just adds another level of annoyance to walking through town and can completely derail whatever you were doing at the time. Even the map itself works against the player as it's procedurally generated and will change with each playthrough. So if you need to find something, such as the shady dealer, you can't rely on a previous playthrough or walkthrough to find them. While a changing map would be a cool analog to the reported effect of too much joy, that is, being unable to find your own home, it is beyond frustrating and only serves as yet another roadblock in moving through the main quest. Combat in We Happy Few is basic and clunky. There are no guns in the main game and the melee weapons you have break quickly. The lack of guns becomes especially annoying if you've played the DLCs because they all have projectile weapons so why we couldn't have something like this in the main game is beyond me. Combat in We Happy Few is basically circling the enemy and pushing the hit button until the stamina bar runs down, then letting the stamina increase and hitting that button again. It is the most basic type of combat it could be, and with the limited stamina it's only really effective with a couple of enemies at a time at most, and only then because the NPCs are also fairly bad at combat. 
The first main storyline fight we see actually provides an interesting option of using a lethal or non-lethal weapon. This experience gave me the expectation that we would have this option throughout the game, finding lethal and non-lethal weapons alike, and being able to choose how we approach combat. This is not really the case and basically every weapon you find is lethal, so you will have to craft non-lethal weapons or use your own fists and takedowns if you want to avoid killing. And after having the option so early in the game, this really feels like an oversight. And like the use of the drug Joy, it felt like something the game could have done a lot better. Joy is a central part of the story of We Happy Few and a central part of the day-to-day -day lives of the citizens of Wellington Wells. It was a very promising part of the gameplay and is fairly unique. You were meant to need Joy to blend in and pass through the Joy detectors and avoid the nose of the doctors. But you don't, not really. The doctors show up later in the game, so by the time you need to deal with them, you probably have the perk that allows you to run without aggroing the population, so you can just run past them. Even if you don't have the perk, running and hiding works fairly well anyway. The same goes with the joy detectors. I would usually just run through them and then hide. Otherwise, I would just use one of the nearby joy booths, so access to joy was never really an issue. And there wasn't any major consequence of taking joy throughout the game. The game does provide an alternative solution in the form of sunshine, a drug that gives the appearance of being on joy, but I never really used it in the game beyond testing it out, as there isn't really a reason to need it. Overdosing and withdrawing from joy are both interesting, with overdosing making your character fairly useless, and seeing them try to fight while overdosing is quite funny. While overdosing, everything is even brighter than with normal joy use, and the rainbows in the sky are replaced with psychedelic swirling colours. Withdrawal is more annoying as people aggro if they see you, which means you likely need to hide if you are about to go into withdrawal in town. The change in the visuals is also fantastic though, with everything looking worse than it does in reality. If too much joy builds up into your system, the game also introduces the effects of too much continued joy use, which is meant to cause you to lose your memory. This doesn't really have any real impact on the gameplay though, which is kind of disappointing. If we could see elements of the map being taken away because of too much dual use, that could have been an interesting way to display it, but as it is, it just feels kind of meaningless. Also interesting is Ollie being joy intolerant, with using joy even once making him throw up. It was an interesting character quirk, but again, the game didn't really do anything with it. It would have been more meaningful if, as Ollie, you needed to use the antidote drug Crash within a certain time limit to keep him alive or otherwise have Ollie's intolerance mean something more for the game, but as it is, it doesn't add much either. The main element though that worked really well in theory but quite poorly in practice was the self-contained nature of each of the character stories. Each of the stories plays out completely self-contained and by the time you finish Arthur's playthrough, you may have completely forgotten or not even realised that there were two more acts to go until the Act 2 loading screen comes up. At this point, you probably have the sense that you have seen the story, the character that you were invested in is leaving, and your work is done. As you watch Arthur walk across the bridge with the bobby that allowed him to escape the Germans all those years ago, it feels complete. It does not feel like there's anything left you need to do. That was how I felt the first time I played the game, and I then left it for quite a while before coming back and delving into Sally and Ollie's stories. So those are my thoughts on We Happy Few. If you are watching this video and you haven't played the game, I do recommend giving it a go and sticking it out to the end if you can. I know I'm glad that I experienced We Happy Few and finished it, but I don't begrudge anyone for deciding it isn't for them. I hope one day there will be a remake of We Happy Few which gives the story the game it deserves. But that about does it. I hope you like this video. If you do, please drop me a like and let me know your thoughts in the comments. Have you finished the game or did you stop partway through? And is there anything you think is particularly good or bad about the game that I didn't mention here? I'm thinking of making a video on the history of the world of We Happy Few and how it differs from our own, so if that is something you would be interested, please also let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I'll talk to you again in my next video.